everyone. With this last talk, my aim is to explain uh, why is this sudden interest in uh, QI? Where has it come from? Why is it suddenly uh, everywhere? Uh, and followed by some guidance on how to learn it to make it easy, straightforward, and dare I say, it, maybe a little fun. So we know that the quality of healthcare uh, varies throughout the UK and the world. It's not always safe, and it can lead to very poor patient experiences and outcomes. Uh, the mid Staffordshire and public inquiry is a terrible testament to this. And there's also the current economic downturn. Hospitals are being squeezed, and healthcare services are being challenged to respond to this, not through indiscriminate cuts, but we're trying to improve efficiency, drive up quality, and reduce levels of harm. This is further compounded by an aging population coupled with chronic health problems, and these are all putting huge new demands on our medical and social services. And um, finally, maintaining quality. It's a key requirement within the NHS quality accounts and the sequins payment framework. Um, and of course, all these drivers extend beyond our shores. So for example, in the United States, it's a country facing spiraling, increasing healthcare costs. And the um, QI BMOF, that is the Institute of Healthcare Improvement, has come up with this triple aim, which I'm sure you've heard a lot about today. And it aims to improve the patient experience of care, improve the health of the population, and do this cheaply, so reduce the per capita cost of healthcare. And it's a drive present within the whole NHS, uh, and it's integral to the current NHS change model. And uh, this was created to support the NHS to adopt a shared approach to leading change uh, and transformation. And within it, you can see the spread of innovation, transparent measurement, and improvement methodology is quite integral to this. So as healthcare professionals, uh, we find ourselves firmly at the center of the quality and safety agenda. Um, we all come from having a long tradition of improving clinical safety and outcome. We continually critically examine our practice but we can always do more. We can work parts, uh, we can work together as part of the multidisciplinary team. We can nurture a safety culture. We can learn from our mistakes, prevent harm. We can educate, we can innovate. All the things that we've been learning about uh, today. And we need to make quality the easy option, the path of uh, least resistance. So one of these, uh, this is one of my favorite examples of this is in the past you could give a patient 100% nitrous oxide and kill them, or you could give them 100% oxygen and keep them alive. But just innovating and adding a simple chain so that you can only, uh, you can give nitrous with just by giving oxygen is a simple innovation, but it shows a complete understanding of human fallibility. And it's a further step towards making systems and processes immune to human error, and this is what we should be, all be striving for. <laughs> I really, really like this quote. Um, everyone says, uh, but what about audit? Is QI just a fancy way of saying audit? Is it the new audit? It's not. They're both very different, and they're both integral to improving quality. And I'm quite a simple soul, and the way I like to think of it is audit is something you do to describe what is actually happening, what is happening right now. And research tells you what is possible. And QI methodologies and tools and approaches are a way of bridging uh, that gap to help us bring those new advances to the bedside where they can help our patients. They're all necessary and different parts of the whole process. So when learning about improvement science and quality improvement, a good place to start is to actually define what we mean by quality. And unhelpfully, there is no universally accepted definition. Um, however, the US Institute of Medicine has helpfully or unhelpfully come up with this definition, which is quality is the degree to which health services for individuals and populations increase the likelihood of desired health outcomes and are consistent with current professional knowledge. You can't really argue with that, but it's not particularly helpful for, helpful for us. It's, it's a bit confusing. But helpfully, they've gone on, and they've split quality into the six dimensions of, uh, of healthcare quality. So uh, healthcare should be safe to avoid harm to patients. It should be effective, it should be evidence-based and produce a clear benefit. It should be patient-centered and maybe go one step beyond that and actually be person-centered to establish a relationship, a relationship between the practitioners and patients and ensure that care respects the patient's needs and preferences. Healthcare should be timely, so reducing weights and harmful delays, efficient and equitable. 
Now, often these um, dimensions are complementary and work together, but there can be tensions between them that will need to be balanced. So whenever you're trying to change something to improve it, it's important to take into account different stakeholders' views about what they feel matters and what's important to your organization. You might come up with something that's particularly effective, but it might make care uh, less timely. So it's all about trying to balance these different dimensions of quality. So we've talked a little bit about quality. So what is quality improvement? Uh, again, unhelpfully, there is no single definition of quality improvement. But the key elements in this definition are the combination of a change, because to make an improvement, you need to change something, but not all changes lead to improvement. And doing this by using a specific method or an approach and techniques and tools to make and analyze those changes. And I'll come back to this many times. So all this is not made up. This has a long history, and it started back in industry. And these are the two grandfathers of QI, um, the two behemoths, so uh, William Deming and Walter Schuert. They were both mathematicians. Uh, Deming started working with Ford Motors, and Walter Schuert worked with Bell Labs. Uh, and in fact, Deming was Schuert's intern for quite a while and considered him his mentor. And they came up with all the basics of uh, QI. So uh, Schuert was the one who developed the concept of saying uncontrolled variation is an enemy of quality. And he came up with the statistical process control charts there at the bottom, which we'll come back to. Uh, he realized that qual the quality of the products they were making would be improved by reducing the variation in the manufacturing process. And then Deming uh, went on and made the often the very famous PDSA cycle. Um, and they fine-tuned their methods during the Second World War, where they helped the American army uh, produce their munitions and other supplies. And then afterwards, Deming took his teachings to post-war Japan, uh, and they were widely adopted, and he's often been credited as aiding the huge post-war economic uh, growth and boost in Japan. So this is probably their master work. So it was initially, Deming made it, but he called it the Schuerts. PDSA, so it was all quite confusing, but it was uh, Deming's idea. Uh, it's quite intuitive. It feels quite familiar to us, has reflections of the audit cycle, but it's a power, it comes from its simplicity. So you plan something, you do it, you see what happens, and then you decide what to do next. Very simple, nothing fancy. And much like humans, uh, we're pretty good on our own, but the great power of a PDSA cycle is uh, working together, so you do lots of them together. So multiple sequential PDSA cycles keep planning something, doing it, seeing what happens, think of something else, make another change, analyze it, and then these continual iterative small changes, you can build on all your previous knowledge. Sometimes you might do something that's bad, but that's okay. You should fail fast, as Silicon Valley says, put it behind you, try something else. Uh, and keep going. It's a very, very simple, but very, very powerful tool. It's not like doing an audit and coming back to it six months later when you've rotated to a different hospital. It's about doing it there and then and keep changing it, doing it the next week, doing it the week after. <coughs> In addition to this PDSA cycle, uh, the clever Mr. Deming also developed his uh, lens of profound knowledge, which is an absolutely wonderful name. It sounds complicated, but it's just an appreciation that no man is an island. We all uh, work in uh, systems. We work in an environment. And if you look at the literature, they talk about microsystems, mesosystems, macrosystems. It doesn't matter. We just, it's just an appreciation that we work in an environment and that if we want to change something, we need to uh, understand the system within which we work. Because if we don't, every system is perfectly designed to achieve the results it gets. So you have to change the system to, to, uh, to change something. Uh, and this, again, seems very simple, but it was a very big departure, and it was very new at the time. And Deming himself, he defined the system as a network of interdependent components that work together to try and accomplish the aims. So the aim of the system is that everybody gains and not one part of the system at the expense of any other. Uh, and he used the analogy of an orchestra. It's judged not by the quality of its illustrious players, but it's judged by the listeners on the quality of the whole sound that comes from it. Uh, so 
taking all these ideas forward in time from the sort of post-war industry and into healthcare, uh, one of the great advocates of quality improvement was the Professor Don Barrick. He was president of the IHI for nearly 20 years, and he's another great advocate for improvement science and bringing its methodologies to healthcare. He's also one of the great speakers of our time. So if you do have a moment, do watch Escape Fire on YouTube or read the transcript. It's a very, very, very inspiring uh, talk that he gives. And uh, I'd like to say we're best friends, but I completely and unashamedly ambushed him for this photo. Um, <laughs> He's also a great humanist, and he's very, very person-centered. So the um, definition of quality we saw earlier, he, he tweaked it a bit and made it into the IHI no needless framework. So those six dimensions of healthcare quality, he said, safe becomes no needless deaths, no needless pain or suffering, no helplessness in those served or serving, no unwanted waiting, no waste, and no one left out. And it really stresses the human aspect of healthcare. And it probably does deliver a more powerful message. His other great achievement, um, in collaboration with the Associates Process Improvement, is to create the, uh, the model for improvement. And these are the words he said. It's, it, he's really bigging it up here. And it's very important. And this is what it is. Now, this is a purposefully very busy slide, but it has pretty much all you need to know about QI on it. So the model for improvement is the three questions in green linked to a PDSA cycle. So you start by gathering your team and then setting your clear aims of what you're trying to accomplish, because if you don't know where you're going, you're likely to end up somewhere else. So you think of a name, and it has to be good. You can't just say, I'm going to improve cancer services. What are you trying to achieve? For whom are you improving these cancer services? By how much? For when? You need to be very clear and focused uh, and make the, the scope and aim clear. So you'll say something. A good aim would be 100% of our confirmed COPD patients will have an individualized care plan developed by the GP or, or nurse by March 2016. It's a very clear aim. We then have to know, how will we know if a change is an improvement? So this is where you establish your measures, and you can read the quote about uh, measurement there. What measures will you choose? How will you obtain this data? Can you collect it from existing computer systems, or do you have to collect it manually? Measure your baseline, so you know that whatever you do, you can compare uh, before and after. Measure regularly throughout your QI project, so you, uh, and measure afterwards. What is your immediate impact? What is the impact over time? Is it sustainable? And the last question is, what changes can we make that will result in an improvement? So this is where you gather your friends and your stakeholders, and you sit and you brainstorm and you think about changes. This is where you might want to examine your system. You might want to process a map and see what's happening around you. This is where you might want to steal from other, um, uh, from other hospitals from and learn from examples of good practice elsewhere. Shared learning is vital. Because you have to make changes, because, but not all changes are improvements. And once you've decided, then you start doing your PDSA cycles, uh, like we discussed before. And I think for my next talk, I'm going to put even more on this slide at the bottom. And it's always just start small, uh, go for the easy wins, uh, demonstrate your success, and then consider spreading your changes. Um, don't, don't give yourself a hard time and you know, introduce a UK-wide and hearts recovery program. Just start small and uh, demonstrate success. So I'm going to move on to just talk a little bit about measurement. Uh, I keep saying these things again and again. They're very simple, but I just want to drum them into you, that we can make all the changes that we want, but we, only, we can only prove that a change leads to improvement if we measure something. But conversely, you can't just go around measuring things without making changes. The two uh, must go hand in hand. Um, so now we're going back to Schuert's teachings, and he did mention uncontrolled variation is the enemy of quality, and he developed these run charts where the axes aren't important, but imagine your variable on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. And he said that variation is, is common in our day-to-day -day life. So this could be 
the time it takes me to commute to Homerton Hospital throughout the week. Or it just might be my heart rate. And what Stuart did is he added these two red lines, the upper control limit and the lower control limit. And any data points plotted between these lines are just normal variation, common cause variation. And just looking at the statistics of that, you can imagine a um, parametric data or uh, a normally distributed data just put on its side, and you have three standard deviations above and three standard deviations below moving forwards through time. So any data points that um, are above these stand plus or minus three standard deviations become statistically significant. So when you do see that, and you have here two data points, so let's go back to my heart rate analogy. So maybe that day um, something happened to my system uh, and a change happened and there's a data point above this control limit, it's a special cause variation. Something has caused this to happen. And here you can do your root cause analysis to try and find out. So maybe I did a bit of exercise that day, very far-fetched. Or maybe I'm giving a talk in uh, a lecture theater the other day. Now, these things might be good. You'll do your analysis, you try and find out why these things have happened. If they're good, you want to learn from them and you want to try and replicate them. It might be something that's bad though, in which again, you want to try and understand and try and sort of squash them and make sure they don't happen again. But it's all about seeing what's happening and trying to understand where, what, what's happening to your data. So, I've been talking a lot. How do I actually do QI? So I've worked with um, the lovely Carolyn Johnson from George's, and we've made this little video. So as, as you uh, no doubt know, when you're coming for surgery, it's a good idea not to eat or drink beforehand. It makes it all just generally very safe. But sometimes we unnecessarily starve our patients for very long periods of time. So this is a QI project to try and reduce those starvation periods. Hello. This short animation is going to demonstrate the use of the model for improvement in a QI project. The specific subject here is fasting times before elective surgery, but the model can be applied to almost anything. Like most other projects, ours started by gathering a project team including all members of the multidisciplinary team, including patients too. We started by setting an aim. This may seem obvious and an unnecessary step, but a clear and succinct aim will help you to keep your focus and avoid your project spreading into other areas. Remember to make it smart, that is, specific, measurable, attainable, relevant and timely. We decided to limit our scope to same-day elective patients, excluding obstetric, peds, cardiac and neuro, and concentrate on fluids as this has the best evidence base. We initially set ourselves a deadline of three months for improvement. The next question in the model is about measurement, which you can read more about in our measurement learning module. We chose to measure average nil by mouth times. You could also measure number of patients above a certain set standard, but we chose average measures for simplicity. There are also a host of process measures, feedback from staff and patients, percentage of staff completing our information cards, etc, etc. And we have balancing measures, measuring the number of delays or cancellations, as our changes could have adverse effects which we need to know about. The last question in the model is about what changes you can make that would lead to an improvement. We came up with some ideas by asking staff and patients for their ideas, asking other hospitals how they manage this and searching online and in journals for similar projects. So then we take each improvement idea and put it into a PDSA cycle. That means we plan how we're going to make our improvement intervention, then we do it, then we study it by measuring the impact that has, and then we act on the results. That might mean modifying our intervention or trying something different, then we come up with a modified plan and go around the cycle again. So our first idea was to try a patient held document, which staff filled in with personalised nil by mouth information on the morning of surgery. We planned it out and then implemented it. Then we studied the effects this had on our measured fasting times and other balancing and process measures. We found this had a very small effect on fasting times. And our feedback was that staff forgot to fill it in or patients lost it or it accidentally got filed in the notes. 
so we decided not to pursue that idea any further and to try another. Our next idea was to ask staff to record and display nil by mouth advice on a whiteboard so everyone could easily see this information and we weren't relying on verbal handovers of information. This had a bigger impact on average nil by mouth times and our feedback was that most anaesthetists find this easy to do and completed the information as requested. Reassuringly, we also didn't see any increase in delays or cancellations. We still wanted to involve patients in our improvements, so we decided that in our next improvement cycle, we would emphasise fasting times and slightly change our preoperative patient information on fasting. We find that this had another positive effect on our fasting times. You can see that by testing and refining change ideas in turn, you can accumulate quite a big improvement over many improvement cycles. However, over the next few weeks, our average time started to creep up. We looked at why that might be and found that compliance with our new processes was slipping, which is quite common after any change. You can see that keeping an eye on data and a range of outcome and process measures is very important to know how you're doing. So in our next cycle, we concentrated on sharing information and educating our colleagues to improve compliance with what we had already changed. Thankfully this had the desired effect and our average times improved again. You can carry on changing and refining your process across a number of cycles or you can then formalise what you've changed as official hospital policies once you're happy that they're working well. So in summary we've seen how the model for improvement can help us plan and execute an improvement project. Good luck with your project and don't forget to add it to the PRISM website so you can share your successes with others. So that was a really nice example and Carolyn did a lot of work for that. Um, so we also got some money from Health Education London and um, I assembled a team of lovely QI experts and there were boys there but they didn't send me any of their photos. Um, <laughs> And we made this uh, uh, website. It's uh, based on the Royal College of Anesthetists QI um, uh, curriculum, but it's very, very broad and generalizable. And the plan was to make it very, very accessible. So you can just click on the education uh, part, do the learning module. You can learn all about systems and processes and uh, the model for improvement. Lots of videos, lots of interactivity. Um, I showed this to the Royal College and they like it so much they're stealing the content for their e-learning e systems but um, I really want to retain this as a website because it's just very very accessible um, great for trainees and also for consultants who might be finding that uh, the trainees are coming towards to them to supervise a QI project and they might not necessarily know how to do it um, there's the learning module which you can dip in and out of and it's split into lots of lovely little chapters and we could take you through all the variations uh, and things we discussed, lots on human factors. Um, uh, but I think also very usefully, I've put lots of how-to guides that are freely downloadable. So how to use the model for improvement, you could just download these Word documents, how to create a run chart, how to process map, how to do a driver diagram. And then also I've made some Excel templates. So if you do have some data, you can just put in into these Excel templates and generate your run charts and SPC charts and just uh, start improving. Um, also for shared learning, you can submit your QI project. But by, by no means is this the only resource. There's plenty of resources out there. And I'm happy to e email a list uh, to anyone. That's my email there at the top. Um, and finally, this is a little bit of a plug. It's nothing really to do with me, but in March... Uh, there's a big meeting at the, uh, the Royal College of Anaesthetists. Um, it's got a whole section on enhanced recovery, Dr. Cooper, so I'm sure you'll like that. But um, Dr. Don, uh, Professor Don Berwick is coming and actually giving the plenary there, so it's always a great, um, uh, it's great to watch him speak. So if anyone's interested, then do go to that. Thank you. <laughs>